Fox and, and, and others who have done the forensics, we even have actual forensic comparisons of weapons, just like you see on CSI, so that they, you can tell where a weapon was fired on the battlefield based on shell casing comparisons and head markings as compared to the rifle that they found, where that rifle was fired. Uh, all of the documentary evidence is, is primary sources. That's what you're always striving for. First sources are always the best. Eyewitness sources are always the best. We don't have those. Then you try for written documents and first sources. Uh, and then the, the testimonial evidence, we've got the, the, the inquiry in 1879, the Reno inquiry. You've got all of the letters that went back and forth between the, with the officers and the enlisted men during, before, during, and after the battle. Uh, all of those things are investigated in nature. That's how you investigate a case. That's how you do research. Probably. So that affected me very strongly. Let's go beyond that. Let's say you can travel back in time and inhabit the mind of any of the individuals involved, or any of the individuals whose artifacts are featured in the when you go back, oh, you could have a beer with any of them. I know this table over here is going to love this. There's two of them, Custer and Reno. Okay. If I could get in their minds and know what was going on in their minds when they made the decisions that they made and why they made those decisions, that would solve the mysteries of a lifetime here. All those blades of grass might even can be less controversial. <coughs> Do you think there would be an amicable beer? Would it be a pleasant? Yeah, probably be would not. Say, no, because Reno and Custer did not agree to go on. And, and because uh, personally, I think Reno is a good thing. And this is my, this is my last question to be before we maybe turn it over to the audience. So, we've completed this book. Sitting over there, uh, ready to be signed. You're Leaving Custer and Little Big Horn maybe behind you. Where are you going, Tom? I'll never do that. <laughs> what's like, what's next week? Yeah, what's next week? Uh, well, my my Marine buddies all want me to do a humorous book about my experience as a narcotics agent in Vietnam. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was great. Uh, I'd like to do a fourth novel. I've got three, but now my, my protagonist is a little long in the tooth. Right? So I might have to go back and write a novel in between. Um, I thought about doing The War of 1812, a book just like this, only on The War of 1812. Uh, and uh, Benny Williams came up with a great idea tonight about doing a, a book with, with all of the artifacts that we in the Marine Historical Company have collected. Uh, over the over the past 10, 10 12 years, yeah, something like that, uh, and doing the same kind of a book only on artifacts of the United States Marine Corps, uh, and that's what I kind of think it's going. I don't know where it's going to end. How did the little big one book change? Did it affect you? Are you a different person now? Oh, I think yes. I I, I know Rosemary is because she's so tired of hearing. <laughs> She doesn't want an next project. She doesn't want an next project. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think I think uh, every time I, I do a research project, I love to learn. Every time I do a research project, I learn more. It always changes me. I always I, I change views on things. Uh, I don't want to make you better, of course, with the circumstances. Ladies and gentlemen, join me in thanking again. Well, I talking about, I think that Custer went on the defensive when he was up, when he realized he'd lost Calhoun Hill. But if he had been waiting for Benteen and Benteen had arrived, 
Benzine would have brought with him another 150 men, and he would have brought with him a pack train with the ammunition and another 120 men, and Custer would have had a fairly large number of men up there on Custer Hill, on the ridge. He probably could have, if nothing else, if even if with all the Indians attacking, he probably could have fortified that ridge and held there the same way Reno held until Terry arrived, the next year. Terry arrived at 27, so he would have held it for that same period of time. I don't think it would have had a bearing on the outcome. I think the Indians, you know, when people say, what is, what's the main reason when, you, when all is said and done, why did Custer lose? And the simple answer is, the Indians were better. That's it. What do you think would be how the Indians changed the mindset of the ghost stands going on and, and your mindset it was kind of like for them it was their last stand, it was do or die, they had nothing to lose. So do you think the part that changed the Indian mentality that this is our red line of sand, we have to get out it's it's now or never? Absolutely. Absolutely. The, 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 for those who didn't hear the question, uh, what was the, did the mentality of the Indians knowing that it was it was going to be their last hurrah, basically, that they were slowly losing the buffalo and they were losing their way of life, did that have a bearing on how they fought and how they how they acted? I, absolutely. I think that that was in their minds. They knew this was, this was the last chance to resurrect the Plains Indian way of life. The buffalo were already disappearing. The railroad had come in, the, the, between the railroad and the movement west, and the buffalo dying, everything that the Indians had came from the buffalo. That was the Plains Indian. If they weren't, if they weren't buffalo, they would have to move on the reservation because they'd have no other way of surviving. And so this was their last chance. And although they also saw, it started fighting defensively, Reno came at them. They saw that they were beating Reno, and that gave them even more emphasis and impetus. And that was probably a factor in it too. But all of those thoughts that this is my last chance. And the other sad part about it is that I think the Indians, the warriors, knew that they had a victory that day. They had a victory at Rosebud, and they had a victory at Little Big Horn. But the elders knew better. They knew the victory was going to be short-lived. People like Crazy Horse and Gall and Sidney Bull, they knew that they may have won that day. But even that day, they had to move the next day because Terry was coming. They knew it was the beginning of the end. And that's, the, that's I think, the, the sad part. And it was only a year or so later before uh, uh, Sidney Bull surrendered then was killed. Uh, or I'm sorry, not Sidney Bull. Crazy Horse was surrendered and then was killed. Sidney Bull went north into Canada. He stayed there for about five years with some of the Lakota Indians, and then he came back across the border and he surrendered, and then he was killed. And then it was the ghost dance. And that was pretty much the end of the Indian Wars. Any more questions, sir? Is there any indication or evidence that uh, Cody was first or last to go in this in this end? Or Custer, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Oh, there's, there's was he the, you know, is he like the picture where he's the last guy with a pistol out there, or was he the first one at the front end as the front end leading general? There's, a, it's really more interesting. <laughs> <laughs> there's evidence of, of all different kinds of stories. Uh, you see pictures of Custer wearing a buckskin jacket. He wasn't. He was wearing his, his, his shirt. You see him with with, with a pistol. He had probably more like two pistols. Uh, you see him standing with his men. But when he was actually found. He was near the top of, of Last Stand Hill, and he was like sitting with his arms draped out, and there were soldiers around him that were killed. It is impossible to know at what point in that last stand he was killed. But there is one interesting fact, uh, to me anyway. Uh, Tom Custer was acting as his quasi-adjutant, his brother. And at some point, there's a story that Tom Custer was totally mutilated. His face was so crushed in, they couldn't recognize him. They, had, they, they knew by a tattoo on his arm at TWC. That's how they identified the body. And maybe the reason he was so mutilated was that by the time it was over, he was in command. He was standing up there instead of Custer himself because Custer had already fallen. We'll never know that. We'll never know when Custer fell. But the, but the prevalent 
story is that Custer stood till the end. He was the last man standing, and uh, by that time the Indians were crisscrossing both ways across all of the soldiers. Uh, they were even seen by by Benteen back at Weir Point, two miles away, through binoculars. Uh, they were seen on horseback shooting into the ground, probably into the bodies of soldiers that were lying there, riding around with Custer's guidons with the, from the company guidons. Uh, those are the mysteries that we talk about when we say that's why this is such a, a passionate and interesting battle because we'll never know the answer to that question. What I read, my, my suspicion is, is that he wasn't the last one to die. The Indians talk about a group of uh, troopers who made a dash to the river and there's like 28 bodies that are missing and never found. Is there any current evidence in terms of what ever happened to them? Yes, it's some new evidence that's come up and I'm not as familiar with it as I probably should be, but there's there's evidence that we're all looking in the wrong ravine, that they thought they went out into deep ravine in those 28 soldiers, and they may have gone into cemetery ravine, which was right next to it. It may not have been looked at so closely to try to find to try to find the remains, but but that does seem to be another mystery, another one of those things where we just never know. Frank, right? was it Terry or Gibbon that was first on the field after that battle? I was told it was good. In, in, in the line of march, they were together basically. Uh, so Gibbon was coming from the beginning. Gibbon was killed, wasn't he? Yeah, but he had, he had, he had recovered, him. and he was the first on the field. But yeah, Terry and he were in the same column. Yeah, I think it was uh, Terry was the first. I think Bradley reported back to Terry. Because Gibbon wrote some articles after the battle. So the captain publication of all of the publications where he talked about it getting on the field and it's very tough to Right. See, I thought he was coming in from the west, where Terry was coming from the east. <coughs> no, they were both coming in the same way. Had it? They merged with <coughs> They were both coming in the same way. Sir? Uh, there was a movie made about 1991 uh, that I felt gave a fairly good representation of this. It was called Son of the Morning Star. It disappeared rather quickly. I don't know if you can get it or not. I think you can get it at the Custer Battlefield site. I think you can get it on Netflix. Yeah. Can, you, can you get it's that? Netflix. Have, are you familiar with this? And yeah. how do you feel about it? I mean... <laughs> 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 I, having had experience making a, a couple of movies and in this sort of, like Gettysburg and a few others, and there's some people in the audience who were there with me when, when we did this, uh, I have very little faith in the accuracy of movies, but if you compare Sun of Morningstar to all the rest of the trash that's out there, it's probably the best of the trash. <laughs> <laughs> Sir? So, I've read through years of uh, Custer refusing the Gatlin dog. He did. Would you think that would have made a difference since he was on the ground? It probably would have made a, a difference in that he probably never would have found the village. Right. Because the Gatling guns were very heavy and very hard to move. And they would have slowed him down tremendously and everything would have been changed. The whole dynamic would have been changed if he had to worry about getting those weapons across that kind of terrain. Uh, I think it was a very wise choice to not take the Gatling guns. I, it, it was a very wise choice not to take the 2nd Cavalry because he knew he was leaving Terry with no cavalry whatsoever. Uh, and they were also offered. Yeah. Yeah. I have to keep asking this table to go. <laughs> Bruce Lidick and Dave Harrington and all the folks over there, as I say, they probably know more than I they've forgotten more than I know. Any other questions? Huh. Yeah. I'm going to prime you a little bit. And like, going back to the Custer uh, issue, like that, your opinion, and like that, based on forensic evidence of the wounds actually suffered by Custer, and the fact that his body was actually sitting in a splayed position, and the lack of comparative utilization of the original body, in your opinion, do you think he committed suicide? Uh, <laughs> Not that I put you on the spot anymore. I, we'll never know, so I could, I could opinionate it one way or the other. Um, 
I, I don't, I, I would have loved to have been the forensic scientist who looked for the powder burns and such. And then I would have been able to answer that question better, but we'll never know that. Uh, he had a wound that could have been suicide. Uh, and, you know, there's something that, that many of you may not know, and this is another, another myth, but uh, as far as I know, Sitting Bull, Crazy Horse, and Gall did not know they were fighting George Armstrong Custer. They didn't know it was Custer up on that hill until later. And they were just fighting a commander of a, of a blue-coated cavalry. Um, I think, you know, I'm not answering the question because I'm not sure there is an answer to any. I think, I think that it requires more evidence to make that a quantum leap if you commit a suicide. Uh, if I were looking at it from what I know about his character, I'd say no. I'd say both he and Tom fought to the death. They wanted to go out with the place for it. Did, did Custer have a reputation with the Indian community at, at that time already? That did, if they knew they were fighting him, they would have potentially changed their action? I think he had a reputation with them. I don't think I don't think that that reputation connected to the battle. And your other question was, would they have changed what they did? Would, would the Indians have, have changed their approach if they knew Custer was I don't, think so. I, don't, I don't think they had a, a whole bunch of respect for him, so I don't think it would have mattered to them one way or the other. Uh, I, I, at, at the risk of being flippant, they might even have been amused. One more? Yeah. Hi, Will. Hi, George. Right. Uh, I was wondering if you know, from the Indian perspective, other than the book Black Elk Speaks, are there other... Native American Indian works that are looked at as shedding light reliably on what actually happened from the Native perspective? Wooden leg. Wooden leg. Wasn't there something in the late 20s and 30s? Indian fights and fighters or something of that nature? Great Mishnah wrote a book. Great Mishnah. Dawn, which uses Indian testimony, and it's considered the finest. Did, did, you, did you get that, sir, George? Uh, yeah. Dakota Dawn by Dakota Noon. Dakota Noon. Dakota Noon by uh, Greg Mitchell. Okay. Actually, I used his his analysis of the Indian camp in my book. Yeah. Uh, I think he's. I think he uses a lot of testimony of the Indians. The problem with the testimony of the Indians. It was that first they didn't trust it. First of all, they didn't want it because they wanted to make their own story up and to, to cover the circle of the wagons, this big defeat of the U.S. Army. Uh, second, when they interviewed the Indians, they were talking one language. The Indians were talking another. Even when it came to how, what time things took place, and the people that were doing the interview didn't necessarily have good interpreters. They didn't necessarily understand what the Indians were saying. And they wrote it all off as contradictory. And, oh, that's just too confusing. And for many, many years, that's the way it went down, because the Indians never wrote anything down. It was all word of mouth. It wasn't until, what, 19, 18, 19, or 1930 or 20? There's some in the early 1900s. Yeah, the early 1900s, at least, when they actually started taking the Indian testimony and comparing it to what the soldiers said with some sense to what the Indians were saying, to actually delve into what they said. And if they described the sun being up, it didn't necessarily mean noon. It could have been any time from 11 to 1. Things like that, that, that those, those expressions that the Indians used. When they finally got around to it, when they finally got around to looking at the Indian testimony, they found that it was pretty compatible with the soldiers' testimony. Okay, one more, sir. Well, just, just a comment on that. Uh, what I've read, part of the problem is, is that the Indians reported what they saw. It wasn't like a, an overview of the battle. It was what each in, in, individual Indian saw. And part of the problem was is that the interviewers asked them questions based on what they thought had happened, and they expected the Indians to say yes or no. Well, the yes or no may have not have had anything to do with what the Indian actually saw. Yep, that's absolutely uh, true. And, that, and by the way, when you're talking about research and interviewing, interviewing techniques, um, that's exactly what you do in either an investigation or in research. You have to try to zero in 
and what the truth is, in spite of the fact that people tend to over embellish or they tend to say one thing happened and when they're actually saying it twice, uh, if, if they see five men run by and then they see five more run by, they see ten men, but it could be that they went around in a circle and came by again. It was the same five, they just saw them in a different place. Uh, those are the kind of things that became very, very difficult in the end. Uh, so, one last question. Uh, what, what's your opinion as far as Mr. Finkel, who, uh, in their indications, had said that he might have survived the massacre? Is it a or a false thing? Yeah, I guess you want my opinion. Yes. I, I, have, I, I need to see a lot more evidence that he did. I, I don't see a lot of compelling evidence other than his own, his own words and, and that sort of thing. I would need to see a lot more evidence. I need to interview him myself. <laughs> <laughs> and that's not going to happen. So. <laughs> All right, folks. Thanks, Mary. <laughs> Thank you. Anybody else? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.